Hey class, welcome back to Pauline Theology and Missions. I hope everyone is doing well today. In today's session, we are going to be looking at the early life of Saul, and we'll be looking at his salvation and baptism. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay class, we're now going to move into the PowerPoint portion of this lecture, which we're going to be discussing Saul and his salvation and baptism. So in regards to his uh, conversion uh, or salvation, um, Paul's conversion is recorded in uh, three passages of Scripture in the book of Acts. Acts 9, 1 through 19, Acts 22, 1 to 16, and Acts 26, 4 through 18 are all um, just different uh, passages that talk about the same event of his conversion. And the Acts 9 passage uh, deals with the conversion itself, and then the Acts 22 and 26 passage is Paul referencing back to when he was saved. And I'm just going to read Acts 9, 1 to 19, so we have a basis uh, for what we're talking about with uh, Paul's conversion, and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So Acts 9, 1 says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard for, from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So there's just a reading uh, from Acts 9, and that's going to be the basis of our um, PowerPoint here today. And so what I want you to do is I want you to read and note the comparisons of Acts 9, 1 to 19, 22, 1 to 16, and 26, 4 to 18. And that'll be in uh, the Moodle forum for this week if you just uh, put down the, uh, the verse reference uh, the verse references and what the similarities uh, or, or comparisons that you uh, that you see or or note there. Okay, just continuing on, there are actually three ironies of Paul's salvation. The ironies are is that when he was saved, what was he doing? He was on his way to persecute the Christians. So Paul, or in this case Saul, when his name uh, was called Saul, uh, he was a persecutor of Christianity, and he becomes the a propagator of Christianity, and obviously uh, through his letters to the different churches uh, and, and his writings that which comprise a lot of the New Testament, um, his uh, he's a propagator of salvation all the way until today. So he was a, went from persecutor to propagator. The second irony is that he was a great Pharisee, and we've looked at that in a previous PowerPoint. Uh, and he would have been against the Gentiles. The Jews would have nothing to do with the Gentiles, and especially the Pharisees. Uh, and he goes from being a Pharisee against the Gentiles to a great missionary to the Gentiles. And then the third irony is he was one who inflicted suffering on believers. And we just read that there in the, in the passage. And what does he do? He goes and becomes one who suffers greatly 
uh, for Jesus Christ. So we see three ironies in regards to Paul's salvation. Okay, so we're just going to look through again this passage that I just read, and we're going to look at the the life of Paul and meeting Jesus and and just uh, who's involved, uh, just so we have a good idea of uh, what's going on. Okay, so we're just looking at uh, Saul's life prior to his salvation in this text, immediately before he leaves on his little journey on the road to Damascus uh, in Acts 9, 1 through 3, the beginning of 3, 3a. It's, uh, it, it's talking about what he was doing. He was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus. And he went to the high priest. So now we start seeing some other people that are involved in the story of his salvation. So he goes to the high priest. And what did he want from the high priest? He wanted letters, basically uh, giving him the authority to uh, go to the synagogue of Damascus and then find from there find the people who were of the way which is what christianity was called before they were called christians they were called followers of the way and it's uh, obviously following um, jesus christ who is the way and so we see that the high priest is involved there but then we get to chapter 9 verse 3b through uh, uh, verse 8 and we see that saul meets jesus uh, there on the road, and this is going to be uh, his conversion. And a light shone around him from heaven, and then he, he fell to the ground, Saul did, and Jesus speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. So we see Jesus there. He meets Jesus on the road, and then it continues on, who else was there? In verse 7, it says, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So we see that Paul was not alone on the road to Damascus. He was not just some lonely uh, traveler on his way uh, to go persecute Christians. He had people with him. He had fellow companions. Uh, they were may have been going with the same, uh, same desire to persecute the Christians. He had traveling companions with him. And so they were there. And then we get to the events after his meeting of Jesus on the road to Damascus. And we see two more names pop into the story. And the first one is Ananias. Now, there was a certain disciple, that's a disciple of Jesus Christ, certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision. So the Lord comes in a vision and speaks to him in a vision to Ananias and tells him what he's got to do. He's got to go to the house of Judas. So after uh, Saul uh, was blinded, as it says in verse 8, Then Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So he's blinded, and he goes into Damascus, and he's taken to a house, and that house is the house of Judas. And uh, he's there, and what was, what was Saul doing at the house of Judas? He's praying. And in, while he's praying, in a vision, he sees a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand to receive his sight. And Ananias does that. So Ananias speaks with the Lord, and there's a little bit of a back and forth because Ananias has heard about Saul, has heard about the persecution that Saul was doing and how he has harmed the saints in Jerusalem. And here he's now being told, uh, go to the house of Judas and, and get this man. After, uh, after this back and forth a little bit between Ananias and the Lord, the Lord says that he is the chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. So, so right there we see uh, the mission that the Lord puts on Saul's life, that he is going to be the vessel that takes the name of Jesus Christ uh, takes the name of Jesus Christ out. And on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you see a painting uh, from the Renaissance uh, called The Conversion of St. Paul by Zuckery. And you see the, the Lord is the one uh, coming out of, the, uh, out of heaven. Uh, they're wrapped in the, the purplish, bluish uh, robe and uh, pointing down towards uh, Saul. And Saul is the one that is uh, falling off the horse. So that's just a... Uh, artistic impression of uh, Saul uh, being converted on the road to Damascus. Okay, so let's talk a little bit in detail about the story. Um, Ananias' involvement. So we know uh, where Ananias is from, and he's from Damascus, as it says in verse 10, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus. And we also know that Ananias has a vision from the Lord, and the Lord in this vision gives direction to Ananias. And like I just had mentioned, there's a conversation kind of back and forth between Ananias and 
and the Lord. And and we may think, well, how could Ananias even question this? But Ananias had heard uh, of of Saul's violent treatment of Christians, and uh, so it just shows that Saul's name is out there that he's a persecutor of Christians. And so Ananias is he's curious about this, he's concerned about it, and so he um, uh, speaks with the Lord about it, but we know what the Lord has said. It was going to be Saul's job to take the name of Jesus out. And on the right-hand side, uh, we see a map of Damascus in Paul's day. And in verse 11 of chapter 9 in Acts, it says, So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. And so this is an image or a map of uh, Straight Street in uh, Paul's day. And it's this long, uh, it begins over in here where my pen is. I'm drawing a little X where it begins. And it follow along and Straight Street ends over here. And uh, this street still exists today. And this is an image of Straight Street today on the right-hand side. And there's actually an early photograph, mid to late 19th century, of Straight Street in Damascus in the 19th century on the left. And so the street is still there. And this is exactly where um, Paul would have been staying at the house of Judas. And Ananias has to go there and find, uh, find Saul. So next we're going to look just briefly at uh, Saul's baptism. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. And I'll just read that again, and we can follow along on the uh, four little bullet points as I, as I read it. So in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 9 in Acts, uh, we see the details of the baptism. And you can just follow along on the, with the four bullet points as I read, and you'll hear it uh, there in the verses. But verse 17 says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, meaning that of Judas, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So we see uh, that Saul had a vision that Ananias would come and put his hand on him, and then later on Saul, uh, Ananias walks into Judas's house and puts his hands on Saul, and when he does this, he speaks to Saul uh, that uh, Jesus had sent him to Saul, and immediately the, you know, the, the scales fell from his eyes, and the Holy Spirit filled him, and then, as it says there at the end of verse 18, he was then baptized. And on the right-hand side of the screen is another picture. It's a medieval uh, image uh, of Saul's baptism by Ananias, and uh, this is actually painted in the Palatine Chapel in Sicily, but it is of medieval origin, and it's Ananias uh, baptizing uh, Saul in what looks like a giant goblet. But uh, so that is Saul there on the right-hand side. And as you can see, up here is a hand come, kind of coming out of nowhere, and uh, then uh, a line coming down to Saul as if the Holy Spirit is coming upon him. And this is just an uh, artistic image of uh of this event of the baptism of Saul. So in regards to Paul's conversion, there's um, several theological principles that are, are touched on here in the book of Acts, and it shows the importance of knowing and understanding theology uh, when it comes to salvation. And obviously we see here the pre-conversion uh, theological aspects, the conversion aspects, and then uh, after the post-conversion theological aspects that, um, that occur here for Saul. And so the, um, in a nutshell, just quickly, um, we see six uh, different theologies uh, which would kind of correlate with what is, is called systematic theology. And the first one is hamartiology, which is uh, uh, the doctrine of sin. Next is soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. Next is Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Next is ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Next is missiology, the doctrine of missions. And lastly is pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to just quickly go down through so we can identify them in the verses. But the first one being the doctrine of sin or hamartiology is in verse 1 uh, through 3. And in verse 1, we see that he is um, he's threatening the church. Obviously, that's sin where someone is threatening the body of Christ. Uh, you also see in verses 1 through 3 that there's active persecution going on, and Saul is involved in that. 
And he also, in verses 1 and 2, he sought help from other sinful leaders, other leaders that wanted to persecute the church. He sought help from them to go get the letters to take to the synagogue in Damascus so that the persecution of the church in Damascus can occur. So we see hamartiology. Secondly, we see soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And in verse 6, we see that uh, in this conversion, uh, Saul meets Jesus. He meets Jesus on the road. So um, we see that Jesus is going to be saving him uh, here on the road. So it's, it's the doctrine of salvation. It says he also is the chosen vessel in verse 15a. So uh, to be a vessel of Jesus Christ... Uh, one must be a child of Jesus Christ, because otherwise uh, that one that is lost, the one that is um, not saved, is at enmity with God. So they would not be uh, considered a vessel for Jesus Christ, and they're at enmity with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Instead, he is a chosen vessel. So we see that he is saved here on the road and becomes a chosen vessel for what Jesus Christ has for in store for the rest of Saul's life. And so we uh, see this next theology, which is called Christology, or the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we see in verse 3 uh, that there's a great light that shines down on Saul. But where's the light from? It says, the light shone around him from heaven. So we see that Jesus Christ is coming down and he's going to, he meets Saul on the road to Damascus in a great light. Then we continue on with verse 5 to, uh, to Saul. Um, what does Saul say? And he said, meaning Saul, who are you, Lord? Okay, so we, who, who, is, uh, who is Lord there in verse 5 is cleared up when Jesus says, it says in the verse, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So we see that he's the Lord. And then in verse 10, we see Christology again, uh, because it says regarding Ananias, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, me, Ananias said this, here I am, Lord. So Ananias calls Jesus Lord. And then in verse 16, Jesus is explaining that Saul is the chosen vessel. And it says, For I, meaning Jesus, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so obviously we know uh, that the believer in Jesus Christ is eternally linked with the head of the church, who is Jesus. And so uh, we join, as believers in Christ, we join in the suffering. And that's what exactly what uh, Saul did. He would then join in the suffering of Jesus Christ. So we see Christology. And next we see ecclesiology. In verse 4, it's a very interesting verse. It says, Then he fell, meaning Saul, to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the reason that's a very interesting verse is that there's this link between Jesus Christ and the church and between the head, which is Christ, and the body, which is the church. Because what was Saul doing? It says that he was on his way to persecute the followers of the way. These are people that are in the body of Christ. This is He's going to persecute the church. But what does Jesus say? He says, I am Jesus, this is verse 5, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So Jesus is basically saying, if you are going to persecute the body of Christ, you're actually persecuting Jesus Christ. And so um, there's this eternal link between Christ and the church. Next, we see some discipleship going on, which that occurs within the body, within the church. So it's an ecclesiological uh, principle. So you see discipleship in verses 10 and verse 17. Verse 10 says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So not only is uh, Ananias a disciple of Christ, we also see that he is then going to disciple Saul. And we see that in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's coming there and he's informing Saul what's going on and he's discipling him. He's, he's teaching him, hey, what is going to happen to you is you're going to receive your sight and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's discipleship going on. 
And then obviously in the church we have uh, the ordinances of communion and baptism. And so we see this ordinance of baptism in verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So we see this ordinance uh, immediately uh, after his conversion, he is baptized. We also see missiology, where in verse 15, Saul or, or Paul will go to the Gentile. In verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. So we see missions. We see missiology and the calling of Paul there. And then lastly, we see pneumatology or the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, where in verse 17, it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, as I've read several times already. And then we can flip over to Romans 8, verse 11, and we see this. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And so Paul actually wrote that in the book of Romans, that when one is saved, the Holy Spirit comes and, and fills you. He, do, he indwells you. And uh, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we see there in Romans 8, 11, that when one is taken from being spiritually dead to be spiritually alive, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells that, uh, that lost person to where they have new life in Jesus Christ, and now they are alive. And now just to close out this PowerPoint, we do need to talk about what appears to be a contradiction in Acts 22, 9. And so what happens is when you compare the accounts in Acts chapter 9 and then Acts chapter 22, it seems like there is a difference. So we need to look at this just so we have an understanding of it, and maybe even if if uh, it ever came up that you were have a defense to know what to say in accordance to uh, that there's no contradictions in the Bible. Uh, number one is the translation. Okay, so let's look at the translation. Acts 9, 7, it says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And then in Acts 22, 9, the same account, it says, And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So the first verse says, hearing a voice, and the second one says, did not hear the voice. So what do we do here? Well, really, it's the translation of, of the word and the meaning of the word, the, the original word. So Acts 9, 7 says, hearing a voice. And that comes from the word phonase. Okay, so you can see that there in the Greek and then the transliteration, which is just put into English letters and then how to pronounce it, phonase. And this word means sound, tone, voice, or noise. And what it is, as you don't need to know any of this for any exam or anything, it's just to kind of explain it out, is that in the Greek, this is in the genitive case, which basically means hearing a sound. But then in Acts 22, 9, it says, did not hear the voice. And this is actually from the word phonin, which is the same root as, as the previous word, but this is phonin. And this means sound, tone, voice, and noise also. Same word, basically. But, as it says there on the screen, however, this is in the accusative case which is used here. And basically what this means is in regards to the accusative case is that they did not hear a sound or a voice with understanding. That's basically what it means. And so you can see that it looks like there's a contradiction in our English language, the way it was translated. But really, uh, the better translation would be the second one would be with understanding. And there's a, a pretty good article on this uh, at the CARM website, C-A-R-M dot org uh, by Matt Slick to see this um, uh, a description, uh, a bit more of a better breakdown uh, of that if you're interested in doing that. But then also there's other scriptural support in regards to this. John 12, 29 says this, Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And this is uh, in the context where Jesus is teaching. And as he's teaching, it says in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to, to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, verse 29, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. 
others said an angel has spoken to him. Okay, so in this verse, a voice happens and and people, some people understand it and they say an angel has spoken to him and then others, they do not understand it. So a voice that only Jesus and possibly some select others understood is given. And then for everybody else, it's just a noise and they, it actually sounded like thunder to them. So the rest of them did not hear it. So basically it's best to translate Acts 9, 7 as hearing a sound. As Jesus spoke, the companions, the companions of Saul only heard a noise. And then it's best to translate Acts 22, 9 as, quote, did not hear the voice with understanding because the voice of Jesus was only understood by Paul on the road to Damascus. So I hope that uh, kind of helps in regards to looking at two of the same uh, two passages of the same event, and what looks like an apparent contradiction. But when you look at the translation of the word, and then you look at some other scriptural support in the book of John, you can see that sometimes uh, there's there's um, a voice from heaven that some people understand it, and others it's just a noise to them, and they don't understand it. And so I, I hope this helps in regards to this apparent contradiction. Okay, so that is it for this PowerPoint. I'll see you in a second. All right, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to be looking at Saul and his call and preparation for ministry. I'll see you then.